Hello, uh, I'm David Zyla. Welcome to another edition of NAC at Home. Uh, this, is, this series is produced by the National Arts Club, which is a nonprofit arts club in New York City. If you're not familiar with the club, please visit us at thenationalartsclub.org. Um, today, I'm very excited. We have the supermodel Claudia Mason with us. And uh, for those of you that are not aware uh, about everything about Claudia, I'm gonna tell you. Uh, so Claudia was born and raised in New York City. Her mother was an actress and a dancer and is a writer, editor, and activist. Her father is a teacher. Growing up in such an artistic household heavily influenced Claudia who started studying ballet at the age of five and trained at the prestigious School of American Ballet. Claudia was a dance student at New York City's High School for the Performing Arts when she was discovered at a music store by a scout from Elite Modeling Agency. She went on to become one of the world's top models, working with designers including Yves Saint Laurent, Karl Lagerfeld, Versace, Armani, Oscar de la Renta, Valentino, Marc Jacobs, and Calvin Klein. She was also featured in the, on the covers of such magazines as Vogue, W, Mademoiselle, Elle, Cosmopolitan, and numerous foreign publications. She starred in prestigious fashion campaigns for Versace, Anne Klein, F and Fendi, amongst others. She worked with all the world's greatest fashion photographers from the late Richard Avedon to Bruce Weber, Patrick de Micharlier, Stephen Meisel, Stephen Klein, Peter Lindbergh, Mario Testino, to name a few. Uh, MTV hired Claudia to host their fashion special, Fashionably Loud. She was also featured in Woody Allen's film, Celebrity. However, it was after her appearance in Enrique Iglesias' music video, video for the song, Rhythm Divine, that caught Hollywood's attention. She sub subsequently landed roles in the independent films, Schmoozer, Discovering Daisy, LAX, Lime, Salted Love, and a leading role in the independent feature film, Outpatient. Her theater credits include The Years and Beyond Therapy at the HB Foundation Theater in New York, Two Ships Passing, Pan Andreas Theater in LA, for which she was named Outstanding Female Actor in a Lead Role. A highly successful, critically acclaimed run of Tennessee Williams' Orpheus Descending in LA, uh, for which uh, was nominated for Best Revival of a Play by the Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle for LA Theater in 2010. She also received outstanding performance by a featured actress for her portrayal of Carol Couture in Orpheus Descending. She has appeared on television as a guest star in CBS's CSI New York and How I Met Your Mother on Fox's Kitchen Confidential, as well as on ABC's October Road, among others. She starred in director-writer Rama Mosley's short film, Grace, in a role that was written for her, and she had a starring cameo in The Brass Teapot, Ms. Moley's first feature film that was accepted into TIFF in 2012, and where it was subsequently picked up by Magnolia Films. She portrayed Charlotte in the UK, India. Here lies the second feature film from London-based writer-director Duncan Ward in 2014. That same year, she starred in Venus, an original play in New York called The Goddess, directed by Alice Jenkel. She continues to work as a fashion model, most recently for Harper's Bazaar, Japan, Italian Vogue, Russian Vogue, Love Magazine, VVV, and Twin. Claudia's first book, Finding the Supermodel in You, The Insider's Guide to Teen Modeling, came out in 2016, published by Skyhorse Publishing. Claudia has expanded her influence by adding the role of speaker to her already vast resume. She particularly enjoys guiding women of all ages on the topic of resilience, which is key for building a super life. As she says, it's an inside job. She is also an on-camera interviewer who focuses on the topic of human development and inner life with prominent guests in those fields. She is a spokesperson for the American Stroke Association, and she herself is a stroke survivor, having suffered a stroke from a freak accident. She remains devoted to spreading the word about stroke prevention, early signs, and treatment. Wow. Without further ado, let us welcome Claudia Mason. 
Hello. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Claudia, we are so happy to have you today. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. This is a pleasure. Um, I, I think we need to dive right into it because I have so many questions to ask you. Um, so I think, I think we should start at the beginning. How about you? Yeah. So, so you have um, your background, the people that raise you, your parents are artistic and very clearly into education. Um, would you say that you kind of had the perfect uh, how would I say support to to have this creative career? Like, do you think it was almost predestined right at the beginning? It was like, okay, all the elements are there. I have the support network. Now, now I just need to do it. <laughs> no, yes, and and also what was there was the emotion, the highly emotional dysfunct, the dysfunctional. Oh my God, I can't even say it. They were so emotionally dysfunctional, my parents. So I just want to get that in there, right? Because it all sounds so perfect and lovely, and I am so grateful for all that I have, and that yay, and I'm so happy to celebrate and talk about it all. But yeah, they were they were kooky uh, Manhattan uh, parents too. So I think that adds to a, an artistic endeavor. I think that adds to a life of being somehow in the arts. You have to have a lot. You know, there's something spinning inside. I think emotionally, uh, an angst, a yearning, or whatever. But anyway, yes, I was set up in a wonderful way in that way. I mean, my, you know, we were reading Shakespeare at home and we were, my mother modeled and she loved to dance and I loved to dance and my father writes plays. And, you know, so there was all of that, although they were, uh, I come from a divorced household and there was a great influence, a stabilizing influence of my maternal grandparents, thank God, who really raised me with my, with my mom predominantly. But, yeah, so difficult. I want to just say, because we're in a time, I really love the time. I, I feel we have to be our authentic selves, David, as I know you'll agree. And I come from uh, a, the beautiful fashion industry and I, the incredible career I've had where it's so much is and has been illusion. Even when you're 14, you've been retouched, you know? Everything is kind of perfect. And I came from that that time where everything, and now it's getting a little, let's just have the, some kind of real breakthrough, and that's you know what's happening um, in, a, in, a, in a huge, in a macro level uh, also. But um, um, what I wanted to say was, um, oh my God, I, I knew this was gonna happen. I lost my thoughts. There's so many things, but um, uh, yeah, okay. <gasps> that's okay. <laughs> I'll ask you a question. Uh, <laughs> so you're at the record store. Yes. And someone walks up to you, a complete stranger, and says, how would you like to model? You're a New York City kid. Like, I, I can only imagine the first impulse was, you know, to either, you know, give, him a, give the person a karate chop and run or, you know, or call the police. Exactly. Um, but, yeah. but after that, so, so I'd love to know about that. And then I, I'd also love to know about what happened right after. Yeah. So, I mean, it was funny. So it was a woman, a female scout. Um, I was 13, just about to turn 14. And it was at Tower Records on the Upper West Side, which no longer exists. There is now a Raymore and Flanagan in its place, 66th Street and Broadway. And I was with, I was in the, I was a eighth grader um, at the Cathedral School of St. John the Divine, the wonderful school at, at that wonderful church in Manhattan. And I was with, I was about five foot 10 at 13 and my schoolmate was five feet. And I say this because the scout was from elite petite division. And she came up and she saw me and she said, you know, here's my card, you gotta give it to your parents. Tell them to call us, you gotta come in. You should be a model. And all I remember, although it was a little like, ooh, although I really, being a model wasn't on my radar. At that time I was studying across the street School of American Ballet, the great Balanchine Lincoln Kirsten School that feeds into the New York City Ballet. And that's all I wanted to be, David. I had no interest in anything else but being a ballet dancer. I wasn't turned out enough. I wore a body brace for scoliosis. I was too tall even at that time, but that's all I cared about. So modeling, I didn't kind of get. I was like, oh, she wants me to model, sounds cute. 
because it wasn't, you know, I am from the supermodel era, but that wasn't, when I was 13, it wasn't like it is now, or even at my height, it, it, school, it, well, it was pre-computer, but let's not even go there. But this schoolmate of mine who was a foot shorter, again, this scout was from Elite Petite, and she ignored my petite friend. And so what I really remember from that, to answer your question, was that the next day, in school, there were only eight of us in, the, in this eighth small private school, eight, excuse me, eight females in the class. And this, this schoolmate managed to turn all the girls against me because she was so incensed that she had not been asked to model no. by this guy. And you know, that's all you care about at 13. You don't care that the biggest agency in the world just discovered you. You care that you have no friends in school the next day, no girlfriends. I mean. It's just, but yeah. <laughs> so, so you you cl clearly um, a parent or uh, or a grandparent made the phone call. Yes. Uh, you c must have gone in. Yes. And, um, and what was the next thing? Was it uh, we're going to connect you with a photographer and put a book together, or um, it went so quickly, David? You know, we went in. I think the card was hanging out in the bookcase for a couple of months. My mother couldn't believe it said a lead on it. My father and I went in. That was petite division. They immediately sent us to the main offices, which was on. They were on Fifty Eighth Street near Bloomingdale's at that time, the Elite. And this is the John Casablanca's Elite. I mean, this is the heyday of Elite. Right, it was a. It, they were only elite and forward in town. Not only, but those were really, if you're going to talk about who's relevant and, and and the biggest, they were. And I was discovered by Ford shortly after, but I wasn't. I was no longer discoverable because elite had signed me. But it was funny. But anyway, the point is, so we go in, and like I always say, David, in the modeling industry, you have to be photogenic. You have to be a certain height, although that's changing, of course, in body type. But sticking to that generally. And um, you have to know, you have to have some innate ability um, on how to perform in front of a camera, even if it's, it's kind of a silent pose and an inward pose. If you have that and your look is in, then generally you're gonna do well. I'm not taking anything away from myself or any of us who've shot to the top, but what happened was I had, I was photogenic, my look was in, I love to perform and boom. There you go. And you have whatever that is that because there are tons of beautiful boys and girls, right? So what is it that takes and gets a select few that go to the top at a certain time? And this is before social media and the help of parents who are reality stars and then the children, la, 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 la. And I love them all. I love the current top models. But, you know, this was really being plucked from obscurity. Right. So you have to, so that's what it was. So I was working with Stephen Mizell suddenly and, and Patrick de Marchelier and Arthur Elgord and Vogue and Revlon and Richard Avedon and oh my God, Mario Testino. And I didn't know who any of these people were. Bruce Weber, I mean, why would I? I was 14 years old, 15. So what, it's a business. And I learned very quickly, thanks to my grounded parents who didn't want to throw me to the wolves. They were thrilled that this was happening. It was an incredible opportunity for a young woman in so many ways that I think are obvious, but to make money and to see the world and to get that kind of an education. But they were also aware, very wary of the pitfalls and I had just started high school. So it wasn't as if they were interested in me getting a GED, throwing all of those high school years away. So what became apparent soon in the agency, God bless them, and the wonderful, great Monique Pilard, who was the vice president of Elite at that time, tremendous agent, may she rest in peace, she was great for me. But she and a bunch of the top brass at Elite that, that time took us out to dinner with my parents and tried to convince them to just let me leave school because there was so much, there was such a, a, a um, I was being so highly sought after. And it's a business after all. So they're interested in the bottom line, understandably. My parents just did. So what basically I had to stay in school. I started at performing arts high school because I was still convinced about being, I was gonna be a dancer and quickly switched to professional children's school five blocks away, wonderful private school in Manhattan. I always say that because people like to knock it and I get very upset. I, I had a great education, got into three great top colleges, which my parents insisted on. And they said, listen, we're slowing it down during high school, this modeling career. You can do it sometimes, that's where you're going to professional children's school. 
but you have to get into college. And if when you get that, to that age of 18, the industry still wants you like this, which would have been four years later, then you don't have to go to college, but you got to get in. And I tell you, David, it was one of the best things these highly dysfunctional parents of mine did. <laughs> <laughs> very grounded, very helpful. To this day, I'm proud of myself that I got into these three incredible schools. And no, I didn't go because at that time, now it's four years later when I was 18, after kind of turning down jobs that I'll never, never say in public, certain people that I turned down, it was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, it's now. It's four years later, which in the entertainment industry is a lifetime later, as we know. And I moved to Paris. A lot of stuff was going on in Europe at that time. And then everything started to come back. So, so that was the trajectory from discovery to kind of when I could do it full time at, at 18. And what was the very first job that you booked? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I forget to this day if it was the sport. There was a great trade magazine called Sportswear International at that time. Very large, beautiful printing. And they booked me quite a lot. I don't remember if it was Sportswear International or a Vogue booking. I really can't remember because if it was the Vogue, it was one of the segments of Vogue that doesn't even <laughs> exist anymore. But it was American Vogue. Yeah, but Sportswear International put me on the cover. I think that was the first cover I remember. Um, and we were in Jones Beach, New York, and it was all just so weird to me. I was loving it because I get to perform. I was a dancer after all. But it was just the whole thing was just to suddenly be in, an, in a working environment at that age. It's super young. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so I have a question. How do the clothes that you wear as a model inform the work? Um, you know, whether it's, you know, a photograph, um, whether it's, you know, a, a, a show, you know, how, how, what, how do the clothes connect to the wearer? So much because any of us, when we put on something to wear, you're affected, even if it's your pajamas. So, so then you think of being a model, a high fashion model, especially if you're on a high fashion shoot with like Karl Lagerfeld comes to mind when I shot the Fendi campaign with him in his house in Monaco. Oh my God, so you're the top of the top. You're having these incredible designs that are put on your body. You look at yourself in the mirror, it affects you. It's all pretend, it's big, it's big um, make-believe time, you know, uh, which is so much of the, of the entertainment industry as we know. And so then you can take on a persona. If I'm wearing a, you know, uh, an evening gown from head to toe in black chiffon or whatever, you know, a certain design, it's gonna make me feel a certain way, maybe a sensuality comes out, which is right for the campaign, the photo. If it's a runway job, well, that's live, right? So then you just get to, if it's a short, cute little skirt, you can prance a certain way. You know, clothes completely inform how we feel. And then if you're selling them, if you're a model, which is, you know, who's always, you know, selling clothes, uh, then the, it is gonna absolutely affect how you feel. And sometimes you don't feel good about yourself in some clothes and that you have to use your acting skills to snap out of it. Too bad because you're being paid to wear this outfit that you may not like and you got to make it work. So that's imagination, right? I mean, acting, silent acting to a certain extent modeling is obviously no, then there's, it's a whole, there's acting is a whole other skill, but you know, you are performing as a model for sure. Sure. Um, I'm curious also, um, could you tell us a little bit about the collaboration between a model and a photographer? Mm, great question. Oh man, it's like an actor and a director in a certain way. You, you, I mean, again, always depending on the job, but you're often hired by, well, the producer, the production and the uh, client, as well as the photographer has a say. But if the photographer knows you, he wants you back because he knows that you and he will or she will be able to kind of have a silent communication where he can get what he needs out of you. So it's a very important relationship. Um, depending on if it's a campaign, um, um, which will be running for six months and it's gonna be all over the place and, and they, the client knows what they need and they've communicated to the photographer, then the photographer has to know that he can hire a model who will follow his direction. Um, and uh, 
and be able to expose herself in front of the camera or himself. So you want to be able to talk, I mean, with words, then you want to be able to, <laughs> to communicate without words sometimes when you're actually working. So it's a very important. And I mean, again, when you're super young, it's tough because you don't have much to say and everything is kind of intimidating. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 um, it's interesting, you grow yourself as you, as you grow older in the industry and as you grow, grow along in the industry and you learn how to connect and talk to the photographer and speak up for yourself. And if the photographer is asking you to do something that doesn't feel comfortable, it's important to be able to communicate that in a way where you're not reactive, where you're not being a diva or rude, but you're also taking care of yourself. I mean, this is also so much has come up from the, we're in the Me Too, post Me Too, we're, me too world thank god and i mean uh, i you know i don't want to get into all the necessarily but there's a lot of good in that and i think when people are empowered yay and models should be empowered like any other worker in the world so models have a right you know to be able to go ooh no i didn't know that it would be my I'd, I'd be asked to take my shirt off for this and again nothing is wrong with nude modeling it's beautiful there's been nude modeling throughout history um when it's uh, not gratuitous and when it feeds into the art form and when it, there's, some, there's a reason for it, it's beautiful, the naked form, male or female. But model, if they don't know about it and they're uncomfortable, you're gonna feel it in their face and expression. So the photographer and model have to be able to communicate. And if the model goes, wow, I didn't know and I don't think I wanna do that, hmm. I would hope the photographer can just not be reactive back then and just, start directing her and her what to do. Because again, we're peers. This is what's so important to remember. And I remember learning it more as an actor. You are all peers. You're not less than your casting director who you're auditioning for or the director. As a model, you're not less than the director, excuse me, the photographer or the client. But the thing is you start so young, David, as a model, so young. Everyone is so much older than you generally, even if they're in their early 20s if you're 14. Now, that's not happening as much anymore, thank God, that people starting at 14 like I did. I mean, there have been labor, child labor laws, as I write about in my book, that have changed. But still, when you are under 18, when you're under 21, it's like whatever they say I'm supposed to do. And that needs to shift a little because it's we're all team players. And if that, you know, let, let's just hear from if the model's uncomfortable, so I don't want to keep, you know, I don't want to keep repeating that, but it, or being redundant, but it's, it's, it's just so important. And I think the industry, after all of this and what COVID-19 is bringing up for everyone in so many ways, it's going to be interesting to see how things manifest and move along as things go, get back to normal or the new normal, where thing, people are more heard and it's more of inclusive. Mm. And then that gets difficult because there hasn't been a proper union for models. So... La, 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 la. You, know, you know, you got to interrupt me because I'll just. It's okay. It's all right. Um, what, you know, in a moment, I'd love for you to uh, walk us through some of your visuals. But before that, what qualities does a great model possess? Wow. I don't know if I've ever been, I can't think. Great question. Okay, what qualities does a great model possess? Being present. Because if you're present, you're aware of your environment and what's going on. Mm. You're aware that you're in the makeup chair right now and you need to let the makeup artist put makeup on you and there's a limited amount of time and you need to let the hairstylist do your hair. Oh, they need to grab you for a fitting, being present. It's really pain. It's a pain when you got to stand there and get pinned and buttoned and you can't properly eat a full lunch. And... But you are a model, so you have to be present to what the job requirements are. <laughs> and if you don't like it, I guess there are other things that we can do. Okay. So again, not, you know, being present to what the job is. You have to be able to, you're a professional. So be able to speak and communicate to all the people, the crew and the other incredible artistic um, um, professionals that are there with you, you're, you know, because that will get you your next job. Um, you're, it's not just how you perform in front of a camera, which is so important, but how you conduct yourself off the camera. And no one's, and I'm not talking about a goody two shoes, David, 
But it's not also, you know, I uh, just have to say, the idea of being cool, which comes up so much in entertainment industries. I don't know what that means. And I'm not the first one to say this. It doesn't really mean much to me because cool to me is nice, is kind, is professional, is on time. I'm not saying a goody two shoes, but it's not about you. It is never just about you. So mm -hmm. I think a good model, like a good person, but a good model has to know every endeavor is a team effort. If it's just about you, then take your own pictures and make your own clothes and put on your own makeup and print the bloody magazine. So I think that the time of the me, me, me and the diva, which has been passing for a while, is just going to just phase itself out. Now, it doesn't mean then that everyone else is more powerful than the model and you can just throw her away and treat her like crap. No. But again, equal. We're all in this together. How can we all win? So if a model can somehow have that awareness, then people are going to love to work with her because she's interested in them. And she's not just interested in herself. So that's my, you know, I'm all about the inner life though, David. So yeah, sure. You have to have good skin. I mean, do we, I, I kind of go, does anyone not know that anymore? But right. Good skin, great hair, keep yourself in shape, have a spiritual practice that keeps your skin illuminated and your nails healthy and your hair because if you're getting hired for a hair job and your hair is crap because you're eating crap how do you think why would they pay you <laughs> you have to look good but it doesn't mean do not starve yourself do not go on meds do not become bulimic there are ways of doing it like my book lays out doing it in a healthy way and healthy also means your inner life. How are you, how do you talk to yourself? I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate myself. Or I love myself. I love myself. I love myself. I love what I'm doing. I love David. I love the photographer. I love, and not in some like, Ooh, oopsie doopsie, airy fairy kind of, no, in, in an empowered way. Because if I'm at my best, David, I'm going to give the client my best in front of the camera. If I'm feeling good about my life and myself, if I'm feeling like crap, you can, Jobs can feed on that. Oh, the kind of down and out look. Oh, yeah, okay. And we know that can be great and artistic, even though, you know, I'm making fun of it a little. It's all good. But you can do the down and out, hip, uh, whatever look, a certain hip. But if you're really down and out, <laughs> it's not going to work. So my point is what makes a great model is, is being at their best as a human being. And that's not always possible all the time. I'm not perfect. No one is like that all the time, but it's coming into a room in the studio saying, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm ready to get to work. What do you need uh, from me? This is such great advice, I think, for anyone in any field. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. Um, 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 Oops, I lost you. Did I lose you? Oh, no. Okay. I think it's frozen. Ooh. There we go. Images. Uh, I lost you, David, for a sec. I'm uh, back. Am I good now? I can hear you. OK, great. Um, I'm wondering if you would uh, take us through some images um, from your phenomenal career. Great. Sure. Yes, those are some images. That's right. Okay. Those are some images. Um, are there any that you would like to... Uh, great, here we go. Okay. This was, you know, Max Vatical. What an incredible photographer. What a, what a gentleman. Talking about someone who comes to work and is excited to be at work. Uh, this was, um, yeah, my uh, French Vogue cover. It was the first time I was on the uh, cover of French Vogue. It was exciting. We were in... Um, we were in Paris, I think, God, I'm just suddenly blanking on the location. I, th I think we were in Paris in a studio. I love how he has the light in the background. That's a blue, that's a blue, oh, what are they called? I've always been horrible with photo term, photography terms and the technicality, but the backdrop, the blue big uh, paper backdrop with a spotlight, a big studio light on the back that creates that. And I just, gosh, I don't remember the hair and makeup, but what a great, with the beret and the hair. And Max always made me feel so beautiful and, 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 and happy. And so it was easy to, to shoot that with him. Beautiful, gorgeous photo. Thank you. 
Stephen Klein for, for the A-line and Klein. Oh man, I remember there was an elephant in the studio. <laughs> oh, David, that they used in one shot. I was on top of an elephant, but whenever I see this, any pictures from this campaign, that's what I think about. Um, and I was terrified to go sit on top of the elephant. The elephant was more scared of me because she kept going to the bathroom, number two in the studio, the whole thing. Um, oh, the poor elephant. <laughs> but this was Stephen Klein, as you know, in very intense. He reminds me in that era of like Wayne Mazur, they're both very intense. And I, of course, you know, I've seen Wayne recently. He's just such a delight as Stephen is. But very intense. They know what they want, which is wonderful. They're 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 focused on the job at hand, and we just we just banged out a lot of photos for that. And I think I was flipping my hair around, and that's how it got my braid around. That's how it got like that. But uh, that braid is fantastic. It is. Gosh, who was that? Orlando Pita or Serge Normand or I don't think it was Orbe. Gosh, I cannot. I'm, I I wish I could remember the hair for that. It's a great one. Bowling Pal UK Cosmo. This was, you'd think it would be in London. It might have been in New York though, because I did quite a few jobs with Bowling Pal, the photographer of this picture in New York. And bowling is just such a sweetheart. Um, it's funny, the first thing that keeps coming up when you show me these are the photographer. Isn't that interesting? I think it goes from what you were just asking me before. But I love the Brits. I love, I always love working with British clients. I just found them um, a hoot and um, their sense of humor, the, the British humor. And, and so the client was lovely and, and just wanted me to, you know, the, you know the, I don't remember there was much story to this. I don't know if we knew it was gonna be a cover. You know, you do cover tries sometimes and you shoot a bunch of beauty and portrait photos like this one and then you'll see if it makes a cover. And ah, this did. Okay, so it's, a lot sure. of these are done on spec is what you're saying. Well, it's, I mean, if it's, it's, it was a job for UK Cosmo that was some uh, editorial and then a beauty inside. And then they said, well, maybe it'll be a, maybe uh, okay. it'll be a, a, a cover. Yeah. Some of these are, some you're shooting directly for the cover. Oh yeah. This was fun. Recent years. I still look good. Ha! Amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm having fun. I hope everyone else who's listening to this is having fun and understands my humor. Okay. I love I'm so that. happy that you're all here. This was so much fun. John Aker is a great photographer. Um, this was in New York a few years back and um, just fun. I love to be a goof, David, and I get to be a goof a little more nowadays because when I was a kid uh, modeling, it was a little more of a serious time in fashion. And that's fine. It's great. It's all good. But I just love when I can kind of rip a little more Although this is not really that good. This is not a goofy shot. I just remember feeling kind of goofy that day and having fun with, with John as we took these pictures. You want to have fun with the photographer. It's so true. It's a great question you asked before. Because if you're feeling comfortable, the best of you comes out. Yeah. And that's going to sell the perfume, the bag, the clothes, the whatever the image is trying to sell. This was from one of my favorite men. Oh, God, Christian Lacroix who I think is designing for, for ballet, the Paris Opera Ballet now and, and, and theater more. What an incredible soul. He's such a kind designer and such a talent. And he was what he turned out. My God, the, the oh, designs, okay. David, unbelievable. I mean, and this one is funny because it's wonderful and it's I, I, you know sexy and woohoo. But there's, it makes me think of, I wore a body brace as a, as a kid from age 12 to 18 for scoliosis. And I used to model on set by taking it off when we had the picture ready for the picture. Mario Testino remembers this to this day. But sitting in my body brace during hair and makeup and being very strict with it because I wanted to heal my spine. So whenever I see this, I was long out of my brace during this shot that we're looking at, but that reminds me, any kind of corset always reminds me of my brace years. And it go, I go, oh, uncomfortable, but it, damn, it's sexy what it does to the cleavage, eh? <laughs> Fendi, this is one of the pictures from the, the shoot with Carl Lagerfeld, took this picture, the late great Carl. Um, uh, and this was at his house in Monaco with a phenomenal model, Kristen McMenemy, who is just a hoot. Always had fun working with her. And um, this was in Monaco at Karl Lagerfeld's house. What else do I have to tell you? I will tell you one thing. Working with Karl, what was a pleasure, 
was Carl, Carl had a vast library in any of his houses, but certainly the house in Monaco. And he'd want to, before a campaign like this, although I'm not remembering, it wasn't necessarily for this picture, but he had an idea of how the camp, he wanted the campaign to look, as any good photographer would, and storyboard or what have you. He didn't storyboard, but he had it in his head. And he took me into the library. It was just the two of us. And he took down a book of one of the great artists of, uh, I think, the 18th century. I don't remember which one now. And he wanted me to take in this artist's form and what he was trying to get through in his art with the female that he was, that he was drawing. Because he, Carl wanted me to use that in the photo when we were working. And what an incredible way to learn about art history in that way, right? I mean, I learned some, some things from Carl. Anyone who had the privilege of working with Carl Lagerfeld would tell you, would tell you this because uh, I've spoken to some other models who had those experiences and what a privilege it was to work with him. What an amazing moment, really. Oh, it really was, David. These, I love this cover. Um, uh, I feel like it's, it's very, you know, Spanish uh, torreror or something. Uh, flamenco dancer, which I loved to do when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, Madame Figaro, one of the great French magazines. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and Tien, 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 the great photographer Tien. Oh, I don't know if Tien is with us anymore, but this was, I loved working with Tien. He was very specific and anything he would ask me to do, I would just mimic exactly. And he would always get so thrilled. So we, we just had a ball. Amazing. We had a ball. I mean, his makeup would take forever. He was a makeup artist and he worked for Irving Penn. If, if anyone, I'm not sure if they know of, of Tien, but he was Irving Penn's makeup artist who then became a, a photographer. And he, boy, did he learn a lot from Mr. Penn, of course. And um, he was very specific, very specific with how he wanted models to look and the makeup that he had his brother put on you. The hair wasn't much hair here, but, and the clothes and his lighting and, Tien would take his time, make sure you're calm, you're relaxed to get the most out of you. So he would give you little massages, your face, maybe, oh, oh gosh. <laughs> Hard times, eh? <laughs> take me back, David, take me back. <laughs> Joking. Um, so Estante, the great, uh, you know, this is a line of the brilliant, may he rest in peace, Gianni Versace, my dear Gianni Versace. And this is, of course, Donatella Versace was there with us, um, with Christy Turlington's in this, Naomi Campbell, as you can see, and four male models who, unfortunately, I do not remember their names at all. <laughs> One of the things, if the audience doesn't know about modeling, is that generally, uh, it's still to this day, women are, get paid more and are the main, the main um, appeal uh, and, and highly sought after. And the guys are kind of the background, which is nice. <laughs> no, this was wonderful. It, Patrick DeMarchelli shot that. This is an industrious studio in New York City. And Christy is just such a pleasure as a person and so professional as Naomi is. And we all just, uh, we all know each other from just the circuit and the business. And we had a very nice, easy time. Beautiful. My book. Your yeah. book. We're gonna we're gonna circle back to this in just a little bit, but um, I love that shot of you on there. Wow. Thank you. That was when I was fourteen or fifteen, I think. I didn't know what I was doing, David. I was just so confused. I'm like, oh, modeling, Woo. and I think it's a ballet, ballet hands, ballet hands. Ah, okay. Yes, and this is a PSA that I shot after I uh, had a stroke, thank God I'm okay, but I had a stroke from an unfortunate accident in a dance class. And, um, um, and, and, I, and I was so happy to collaborate with the American Heart Stroke and American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, ASA and AHA. And um, I'm a spokesperson today for them to help spread the word because Myself and my parents had no idea that people can get strokes from accidents who are who were under you know who are under fifty. I mean, it was just shocking. I was uh, you know late thirties at this time. It's just awful. So I'm okay, thank God, and I'm I'm so happy though. It's well, I don't know how much time you want to spend on this right now, but it's it's been the, a blessing in my life to have a stroke. Uh, thank God I've recovered, and I want to just help spread the word about stroke prevention and, and um, information. 
so that if Thank someone I was I was helped by a stranger. I'm sorry. Thank you for doing what you're doing to raise that awareness. Thank you. Um, Thank you for uh, taking us through some of those images. I mean, your your body of work is. Oh, I'm losing you. Why is this happening? David, are you Am back? I... Yes, you're back. Okay. You just totally there's... froze. Yeah, it, there's something that happens when we bring another screen up, which we're gonna, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for walking us through um, just some moments of your incredible career. Um, so I, have, I do have some more questions and then um, I'm going to, uh, if our audience has questions, I'm gonna ask you to start writing those down uh, for us as well. Um, I'm curious, in all, with all of the designers you've worked with, my God, that list, I was basically out of breath reading it. Um, you've worked with literally everyone. And, but is there a designer whose clothes you admire that you've never worn, that you've never collaborated with? Ah, oh, wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, wow. No, that's, I don't want to take too long in thinking because I, you know, who came up? And I, it's, I mean, I respect him. I wouldn't say it's my, but blah, 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 blah. Alexander Wang, because that okay. was more after my kind of height. Someone you haven't worked with. I, yeah. I could totally see that collaboration. We will make it happen. <laughs> um, so, it. would you, all right, so, also, beyond your incredible body of work as a model, you made a segue into acting. And mm -hmm. I am curious to hear how, how did that happen? And how, um, what was that transition like? And it, it's interesting, Claudia, because when you talk about your work as a model, you know, if, if I were at the, the beginning of the interview to say, she's an actress, like everything you said about being a model, I think would fit, you know, the collaboration, the, you know, creating a character, et cetera. Um, but I'm curious how you made the segue into saying, oh, I really want to act. Yeah. This is something that I want to do. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for asking. You know, I had started, as I told you, uh, my life uh, wanting to be a ballet dancer. That's all I ever wanted to be. My mother took me around to museums in Manhattan, Lincoln Center. I was very privileged to see all these incredible Metropolitan Opera and the New York City Ballet and la la la. And I just took to it like a fish in water. I loved watching performers live. And the dancing didn't work out because all I wanted to do was be a prima ballerina at New York City Ballet. And that was clearly not what I was meant to be cut out for. So I, I, um, I didn't think about any other kind of dance. So when with modeling, I had such an incredible career and there was something in me that yearned for that performing arts experience that I missed from ballet. Even though I never became a professional ballet dancer, I loved performing little performances I had done. And I yearned to express myself more beyond modeling still. And so that's the, where it came from. And then I, you know, I, I always had an interest in acting and I took it very seriously and I studied Shakespeare in an HB studio in Manhattan and I did all of these wonderful classes and showcases in Manhattan and all of that. Um, and then moved to Hollywood and thought, well, you know what? It's just gonna happen like this. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> the, the, the downfall of being, of shooting to the top of an industry when you're 14 or 15 is that you think that anything you do and that's not how the world works, thank God. So it was kind of a rude awakening because I'm in, I'm in LA and I not only, this is my ego, I not only look great, but I've studied Shakespeare and I've studied theater and I've done and oh, here I am. And Hollywood just is Hollywood as we know, any, any of the entertainment industries. And they always, I was always seen as the model and, but I was sometimes too, you know, prettier than the leading female, so they couldn't have that. And then they, 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 there was always something, and it just, I worked, I developed, I have a resume, I did some television, I did indies. Um, I produced, as you mentioned at the top, which I'm very proud of, uh, 
Tennessee Williams play Orpheus Descending, yeah. um, which was nominated by the Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle. And that felt great. So now I wasn't just in front of the camera or on stage. I was an executive producer. I knew how to put together a whole award nominated show. And that felt good and empowering, David, because I knew I had to develop myself in other ways because the acting wasn't really going. It wasn't really happening in a way that made sense. It was more auditioning than getting jobs. And the universe has a plan for us all. So you just have to go, you have to deal with what the reality is. And I just eventually decided that, okay, I love acting, I'll still do it, but it's something else. My life is supposed, I'm not supposed to just be doing this now suddenly. It just wasn't. So I was able to go, okay, well, you know, come back to Manhattan. I wasn't really that happy living in LA, although I miss it now. It always happens, right? The grass is always greener. And, um, um, and, and then I had this stroke, this crazy accident that made me really take me, took me down a road of where I am today of a speaker writing a book, a speaker interviewing people. I love on camera interviewing. I eventually will have a podcast. I love to, you know, to speak and help young people find their inner life and their confidence. So I'm going ahead of your question, but it's, it's led me, I'm so happy those LA years of pursuing acting happened because I'm an actress today, great. But that it didn't happen in a way that, that I stayed in that industry in that way is fine, it's okay. I got so much out of it. You know, I'm doing some in Friday Insta Lives. If anyone wants to check my Insta Lives, go to my, handle Claudia Mason one. Um, but anyway, I was interviewing Shiva Rose last Friday, David, and she and I knew each other as actors. She's now big in the, the holistic uh, beauty movement and feminine healing. And she said, we're just different, we're different kind of storytellers now. And I loved how she said that, you know, it's all those years of acting gave, has made me like modeling, of course, who I am today, giving directly back as a speaker and it's helping people, I'll be, uh, you know, with coaching and all of that, with their inner life and their inner confidence and their self-esteem through my own stories also. So I, I like storytelling from this perspective, David, not just from other people's words, because Hollywood, woof. Look, you can say that about any of the entertainment industries, but Hollywood, and it's gonna shift, it has to. We're, we're so much, is there's a paradigm shift on the planet, as you know, especially with this pandemic. But Hollywood is gonna, you know, it sees women as they're the, they're the girlfriend, the wife or the mother. And it's like, it just, these little boxes are just, it's outdated. There's so much that has to cut. And people have to start creating their own work and their own stories into scripted stories. So <sighs> I just stopped myself because I was like, I don't know. That, I don't that's know. okay. <laughs> Um, Sometimes. I had a little technical trouble again. Uh -oh. uh, we'll fix this. Um, so you have had so many amazing experiences. And at a certain point, you said, I need to share this and I need to write this. And you wrote a book. Yes. Um, would you tell us a bit about how it, it came about and what your process was like? So at the time, um, my lit agent, um, an entertainment agent came up. He just said, there's a book in you. There's a book in you. We had met through my modeling agent in London at the time. And he said, there's a book in you. You're so good with, with, with speaking, which is true. He didn't even know me that long, but he could see that. And I think the, 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 it should be, um, the focus audience should be would be models and their parents and how to avoid the potential pitfalls of the modeling industry because you really lived that as a kid in a certain time where there were so many pitfalls. It was very much the boys club that was fine in certain ways and not fine in other ways. So I had delight in writing this book, David. I'm proud to say there's no ghost writer, although there's no shame for writers out there who hire ghost writers, but I will proudly say I wrote the whole thing myself and it was a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Woo. I always knew I could write, but I mean, writing a book, I mean, not, it's not exhausting in a kind of uh, superficial way. It's really almost debilitating <laughs> what it does to, to you. It's cathartic and wonderful, but uh, woof. And I'm blessed. Uh, Skyhorse Publishing, a wonderful publishing house, um, is my publisher. And, but it was quite something. And the book 
I'd love to relaunch one day with a different title. You know why? Because everyone thinks, even though that was the target audience, helping would-be models and how to avoid the potential pitfalls, it has something for everyone in this book because it's really about, I don't have so many mascara tips in this book as I do inner life uh, information and, and tips because how did I get through and how does everyone, anyone get through at any age is what do you have to fall back on within yourself? How do you gird yourself up from the inside? Because you're not, you know, it's not just about good skin and good hair and how skinny you are and how you move. There's tons of people who can do that. What is, what is it that gets you through that keeps you ignited from the inside and interesting to look at in pictures season after season? You have to have some kind of, you gotta be lit up from inside. And you know, the great sages have been saying this from time immemorial, uh, you know, and it's so true, it applies to everything. That's what makes us ex attractive to people when we walk into rooms and makes us, it generally helps us achieve in life and succeed to do our best because we're somehow able to keep ourselves going from the inside and not let the negative stinking thinking, which anyone can fall under, take us down. So I, man, I'm continually fascinated about that. And that's really what I wanted to get across in the book to be empowered from the inside. And then, and so that's how the book came about. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, as someone who is clearly by the comments I'm reading here and from what I have heard prior, you are admired by many. Um, and I am curious to hear, is there someone that you admire? Oh, yes. Oh, so many. Wow, I'm trying to think, you know who I admire? I don't know her, but because I love, I'm really fascinated by interviewing people myself now. And I love, you're so wonderful at it, David, um, is Christiane Amanpour. Mm -hmm. I just think she is so intelligent. I think she's beautiful. I love that she's a, a, a woman of a certain age, right? She um, composes herself so well on camera and how she engaged. I just love Christiane Amanpour. Oh, God someone I admire. And you're saying I don't have to know them or it can be just anyone. No, not right? at all, not at all. <laughs> I admired in a lot of ways, Steve Jobs, um, even though the, the, the personal stories you heard about how he was, were, but what he, what he did. I, oh God, there's so many people. Um, the, the, the prime minister of New Zealand. Ah, what is her name? Anyway, the prime minister of New Zealand. <laughs> We, I think you're putting together a fabulous dinner party. Right yes, now. yes. And let's have you, David Zyla, and let's have me and Marianne Williamson, another person. I mean, Oprah, of course, for so many reasons. Um, oh, wow. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, so many people. Fabulous. So I, uh, we have a, a few questions here. Um, and one is, um, one of, someone writes in, uh, they did not give their name, and asks about uh, what your diet is like. You touched upon earlier eating well. Um, what, what constitutes a good diet? So I'm going to go back to something that mostly we don't think about, being present. Because if I'm not present, I'm eating out of stress, and I'm grabbing sugar, fat, bad fat. Fried, bad fried, because there's good fried foods and there's good fat, right? Um, and there's natural sugar in fruits, but you have to be present. So let me be present. Am I really hungry? Am I not hungry? Now, if I'm hungry, we must feed ourselves. And, and you should be eating enough every day. I'm not going to tell anyone. Look, I, I eat three meals a day and snacks. Sometimes if I skip a meal, I'll make sure I have enough snacks. Life is what it is. It's tough. No one is going to be perfect all the time. But I was raised with a mom because she had a horrible illness as a young person. When I came along, she raised me on a very strict health food, partial macrobiotic diet, which I rebelled against because it was awful how she handled it. Um, Coca-Cola was the devil. How dare you even mention Coca-Cola in the house? I mean, drama. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I mean, I get it. Coca-Cola is horrendous, but you can't do that to a kid. So. I had this great beginning to my, you know, of, 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 a, of a diet early on in life. And so my comfort food is like brown rice and vegetables with seasoning, obviously, and maybe a little Parmesan cheese and having kombucha. 
Um, and um, always go for the real desserts though. The, the, the health food desserts are disgusting. I'm just gonna say it. Uh, give me the sugar and the flour and the- If you're gonna do dessert. it, do it, right? Honey, yeah. do a yeah. dessert, please. <laughs> but food, you know, I eat complex carbs, mostly, I'm vegetarian mostly these days, although I have no problem having red meat and poultry when I want to, but it's just less and less do I have a craving and I used to be completely vegetarian. But you gotta get um, your protein. And you have to, I am not a huge bean person, but then you gotta get it with nuts and seeds, olive oils, avocados, um, deep leafy greens, legumes, brown rice. Um, I tend to be gluten-free because of a very uh, minor, thank God, thyroid thing that I don't have to worry about, but being gluten-free helps. Trying not to eat too much sugar, you guys. Sugar is worse than smoking cigarettes to some people, I think, and I think there's studies say, Horrific. Now, did I just have a chocolate pudding last night full of sugar? Yes, David, and I was thrilled. <laughs> Let's be real. I can't stand people who go, and no sugar, and then a heck, 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 heck. Okay, we are living in times that are tough out there now, especially, you know, we are human beings. You gotta, but that is generally, wonderful advice. Yeah, but you gotta eat well, eat well, eat well, low sugar. Good fats. So Claudia, um, what would the Claudia of today tell the Claudia in You just cut out. What would the Claudia of today tell the Claudia? What would the Claudia of today say to the Claudia at 14 after Tower Records, after the petite friend going all mean girl on you. <laughs> um, and literally booking that first job. And you're, you're, it's your, the day of your first job, you've booked it, and Claudia of today appears. What advice might she give that 14-year-old girl? Breathe and have fun. Don't be so serious. I was such a serious little girl and young person. So serious, David. And I was just saying this in another interview. If there's one thing the entertainment industries are, industry is, and the different industries within it are, is fun. <laughs> I mean, if you can't have fun in these industries, where are you gonna have fun? So, woo! I would have told her to loosen up a bit. Um, my seriousness was wonderful. It came from being a very disciplined little ballet dancer. Discipline has served me very well today in many ways. Um, being organized, disciplined, being serious about keep saving money when you're not working that much. I mean, these are important things, but I would tell her at that point to have fun because I was too serious. Excellent, excellent. Well, Claudia, it has been an absolute delight oh, chatting with you today. Thank you. Um, I cannot thank you enough. I've been so looking forward to this. Oh. Me too. And, um, and I want to thank our, our audience today uh, for tuning in to uh, the National Arts Club, NAC at Home. Uh, if you are interested in more of these programs, you can visit the nationalartsclub.org um, for a calendar listing of other programs. I'm David Zyla, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.